Hello friends, welcome to Secrets and Seal, Sabbath School and Worship Hour. We are so happy that you have joined us. Today we have a wonderful program and we are studying our Sabbath School lesson, Managing Till He Comes. And the lesson for this Sabbath is lesson number seven and to the least of this. We will also have a powerful sermon by Pastor Stephen Bohr. So tune in and be blessed. We encourage you also to support your local churches with your tithes and offerings. God bless you. Join us in singing hymn 272, Give Me the Bible. gleaming to cheer the wanderer alone in tempest tossed no storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming since jesus came to seek and save the lost give me the bible holy message shining thy light shall guide me in the narrow way precepts and promise law and love combining till night shall vanish in eternal day give me the bible when my heart is broken when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear give me the precious words of jesus spoken hold up faith's lamp to show my savior's near give me the bible Holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precepts and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps enlightened, teach me the dangers of this world's below. That safety or the gloom shall brighten that light alone the path of peace can show give me the bible holy message shining thy light shall guide me in the narrow way precepts and promise law and love combining till love shall vanish in eternal Welcome again, friends. Happy Sabbath. And we're so glad that you decided to join us this week for another exciting episode of Secrets Unsealed and Some TV Sabbath School Hour, The Church at Steady. We have been having a wonderful time discussing this quarter's lesson, Managing for the Master Till He Comes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue on with a new lesson in the series this week. But before we get started, I would like to introduce my panel. And to my left, we have Jeannie Wheaton, who heads up our prison ministries here at Secrets Unsealed. And I always add that she is a wonderful cook. She's a registered dietitian, an excellent nutritionist, Amen. as well as an excellent theologian. And so, Jeannie, it's so wonderful to have you in your many manifold talents with us this morning. Thank you, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you. <laughs> All right, to my right, we have my pastor, Pastor uh, Daniel Miranda, who uh, is now the associate pastor at the Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, we have agreed to bring him back for as many programs as we can, mm -hmm. especially here for Sabbath School, because we just love to have you on the panel, Pastor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be with my first elder <laughs> and also with Sister Jeannie. Glad to All be right. here. Very good. <laughs> this week we're going to be studying the topic unto the least of these, mm -hmm. unto the least of these. And before we get started, we're going to ask Pastor Miranda if he'll pray for us. And Jeannie, if you will read our text for the morning. Okay, let us bow our heads for prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we do not dare to open your word without prayer yes. because we understand that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. And as we continue with the study of this lesson, I pray that you may enlighten our minds and also the minds of those who are watching and that we may apply these practical lessons to our lives. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, our memory text is from Matthew 25, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right, very good. Now, as we've been discussing uh, so far this quarter, uh, God has made us managers mm -hmm. of his business here on earth. That's right. Uh, all, all the world and everything in it belongs to him, but he has entrusted it to us to manage it for him. And he allows us to take a certain portion of what he blesses us with for our own use, but then we must divide it up and manage it the best that uh, we can. And part of what we do in managing it is not just supporting ourselves, but supporting what I like to call the kingdom enterprise, <laughs> doing the biddings of God here on earth. And in doing so, we know that part of God's work is to care for those who are downtrodden, dispossessed, the poor, the fatherless, the stranger in our gates, yes. uh, the refugee, if you will, and God left us or sent us an example on how this can be done in the life and ministry of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so this week we're going to look at how we manage the resources God has blessed us with in helping those who are dispossessed, helping those who are struggling in life. And we want to start uh, with uh, reading uh, the verse Isaiah 61, mm -hmm. uh, verse 1 and 2. And Pastor uh, Miranda, if you can grab that for us, Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, we'll start off with uh, some interesting words we find out about Messiah here. Yes, absolutely. This is a messianic prophecy, and here... Uh, the Bible says, reading from the New King James Version, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. All right, very good. Now, these are interesting words, uh, and they are spoken again in the New Testament by Christ at the inception of his ministry, uh, where in Luke 4, 16, uh, Jeannie, maybe you can grab that for us quickly. Luke 4, 16, Jesus is in the synagogue, and he is given the scrolls to read from, mm -hmm. And he opens the scroll and reads from this passage. And what does it say there, Jeannie? It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery to sight of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. <laughs> now, this, this is an interesting statement that he reads from, from the book of Isaiah. And it is somewhat... <clears throat> Countercultural yeah. to the thought of of the of the Jewish religious leaders at the time. Why would that be, Pastor Miranda? What what what's happening here? Well, you know, when you study the book of Isaiah, we realize that 
there are two kinds of messiahs. On the one hand, we have the messiah spoken of in, in Isaiah 9, that the government shall be upon his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And so we see a political messiah, a messiah that would be a king. But on the other hand, we see in Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 61, a suffering messiah. Mm. One that would come down and he would not be a ruler, but actually he would identify with the sufferings of humanity. Now, because of the condition of the Jewish people under the Roman Empire, yes. they were more inclined <laughs> to favor the political Messiah, but not the suffering Messiah. Yes. Because their minds had become so worldly, they were more interested in political freedom, but not in spiritual freedom. Mm -hmm. And because of this, when, when, when Jesus came, he didn't exalt the other aspect of the Messiah, not because it's important, it's not important. We are now expecting that king, yes. the kingly Messiah. But Jesus comes as the lowly suffering Messiah. And this is right when he's beginning his ministry in Galilee in Luke chapter four, that he presents himself as that Messiah that came to help the poor, the blind, the brokenhearted, those who are captives. Well, what was the pro what was what would be a problem with 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 helping the poor, the blind, and and, and setting free captives, Jeannie? Why why would the people have such a difficulty with that? Oh, because at that time, of course, those that were poor, those mm. that were blind, those were, that were um, the lower of society were looked down upon, mm. and they were a lot of um, they believed that they were cursed. Ah, okay. And yes. uh, so they so uh, even even in the church within the church itself. Yes. Yes. Uh, they were outcasts. Yeah, we, we were, oh, go on, Pastor. Yeah, and adding to what Sister Jeannie said, they were very offended when he read, the, when he said the words in verse 21, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Yes. Because in one of the clauses, it says to proclaim liberty to the captives. Yes, yes. So they were reminded of their captivity under, under the Roman Empire, even though they boasted of freedom. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were very offended to hear that Jesus was calling them captives. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. we're, we will recall the incident uh, where Jesus heals the man who was born blind. And uh, when he is brought before them, he says, well, they say to him, how, how is it that you see? <laughs> and he says, well, this man <laughs> healed me. And now I can see, I was born blind. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as the story develops, his, of course his parents are brought in and they say, well, we, we don't know how it is that he sees. Yes, he is our son and yes, he was born blind. Mm -hmm. But he's an adult, ask him how he sees. All we know is that he's our son and he was born blind, but now yes. he can see. And the, the, uh, when, they, when they interrogate the, the, the man who was blind again, he asked them, is it that you want to be his disciple too? <laughs> <laughs> and they say to him, you know, you were born in iniquity. Yes. <laughs> you were cursed. Mm -hmm. How can you, you, you can't talk to us that way. You, you, were, you were cursed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, the dispossessed were seen as those who were laden with the curse of God. The finger of God, mm -hmm. as they said. Was, was upon them uh, for whatever reason it could be because the disciples also asked Jesus when he when he healed a blind man who sinned his mother or his father mm -hmm. and so it was a part of the Jewish economy the, the, the religious thought of the day that a person who had some affliction mm -hmm. had been cursed by God exactly and the poor and motherless and, and fatherless and, and all were included in that mm -hmm. same rank. Now, uh, in, in our lesson, there is a statement at the bottom. Uh, Je Jeannie, maybe you'll read it to us uh, from the Desire of Ages, page 215, that sure. last paragraph. Yes, I have that one started. Yes. Like the Savior's disciples, John the Baptist did not understand the nature of Christ's kingdom. He expected Jesus to take the throne of David, and as time passed, and um, and as time passed, and the Savior made no claim 
to kingly authority, John became perplexed and troubled. troubled. Yeah, so even John the Baptist, John the Baptist mm. was not untainted by the, the thought that the Messiah mm -hmm. should be someone kingly mm -hmm. and not someone uh, associated with, with this idea of, of, of helping the poor and dispossessed and letting captives free. That, that, that was not the way they interpreted what their burning desire would be. Well, you remember the, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that are persecuted for yes. righteousness sake. Yes. And, and it says at the end of his, his Sermon on the Mount, it says, and the people were astonished at his doctrine for he <laughs> yes. taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So the it was like upside down. This was all upside down to them. It was not what they were expecting. Yeah, it was very countercultural yeah. for the day. Right. Yeah, they, 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 they had to re-educate their brains to get on the same wavelength with Jesus. He saw things very different from what was the, the ruling thought of the day mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for those in, in the Jewish um, community. Uh, now this is interesting because early on uh, in Exodus when Moses is giving um, instructions to the newly formed nation of Israel, God, in his instructions to them, gives instructions for relief of those who are poor and dispossessed. And uh, maybe uh, you can read some of that for us. Uh, Jeannie, maybe you can get Leviticus 23, 22. And uh, Pastor Daniel, maybe you can find Deuteronomy 15, 11, uh, and I'll grab a text here, uh, Exodus 23, 10 and 11, and here's what Exodus 23, 10 and 11 says, six years you shall sow your land and gather its produce, but the seventh year mm -hmm. you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your land, the poor of your land, of your people may eat and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. Mm -hmm. So here's the provision. Jeannie, what is your text? Today? Sure, I have Leviticus 23, 22. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Yeah. Daniel? So I have verse 11 of Deuteronomy chapter 15. For the poor will never cease from the land. Mm. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in, in your land. So, you know, without going away from the topic, mm -hmm. but uh, the model, those political models of having a equality in society of all classes. Yes. Um, you know, the Bible doesn't speak about that. Right. It was God's purpose for the poor to always be in the land so that those who are wealthy could exercise mm. compassion and generosity. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. You know, Ellen White makes a statement uh, that uh, one of my mentors used to, to quote uh, when I was working in the uh, community service center down in, in, in Watts, California. And uh, she says that we need the poor as much as they need us. Mm -hmm. And the reason she says that is true, and that, that, that for, for, for young adults, you know, who are upwardly mobile, <laughs> to hear that we need the poor as much as they need us was a, was a stunning thought. Hmm. And the reason she gives is that it allows us to demonstrate the character of Christ. Yes to others, it, 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 is, it is the opportunity God gives us to demonstrate His compassion, the same kind of compassion He has on us. Let me read uh, exactly probably what you were okay. talking about. It says, uh, this is from Testimonies, uh, Volume 3, page 511. 
uh, by Ellen White, I saw that it is in the providence of God that widows and orphans, the blind, the deaf, the lame, and persons afflicted in a variety of ways mm. have been placed in close Christian relationship to His church. Yes. It is to prove His people and develop their true character. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and so it, it is in the plan of God that that we demonstrate the character of Christ in providing for those less fortunate than we are. Amen. Christ at his birth demonstrated his affiliation with those who are dispossessed. Amen. He was not born in, 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 the, in the castle, mm. but with the cattle. Mm. <laughs> yeah, he, he was, was not born... He was putting a bit in trough. <laughs> yes, he, he was not born with the wealthy but with the weary, so to speak. Mm. And so it is, it is through his identifying himself with all classes, he, is, he was God, yet he condescended to be man. And so he is able to identify with every level of humanity. And in doing so, he allows us to know that if our blessings are such that we can share with those who are dispossessed, it is only through His grace that we are able to demonstrate that to others. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, and so, but He doesn't just talk about giving, even though, you know, we're talking about managing for the Master. But here in Psalms 82, mm. uh, 3 and 4, he says, defend the poor and the fatherless. Yes. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Mm -hmm. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. Yes. And so it's, it's, just, it's not just in our... Just providing food. Yeah, in our provisions of, of, of maybe a few dollars or some, something to eat. No, we are to work right. for their betterment. Mm -hmm. for their elevation, just as Christ worked for our elevation. You know, there is a good chapter in the book, Ministry of Healing, that is entitled, uh, Helping the Poor, I believe, mm -hmm. where she outlines the work that we're supposed to do for the destitute. In the, in the case of the poor, she says, even though she doesn't deny the fact that we need to give them food, and I yes. think that's very Christian. At the same time, it is not enough just to give them all the time. Mm -hmm. But we need to, and the principle is found in the verse that you just read, we need to help them grow and be sustainable, teaching them to be useful, yes. te teaching them to save, teaching them self-control, and all these things that will make them more successful in life. So that's why sometimes these models of government were, which is good, I mean, we're interested in the poor, but they only give the poor, but they don't help the poor get out of the poverty mm. with the strength and means that, uh, that the government is providing is not actually doing any good because the biblical model is not equality of society. We have an equality for the purpose, as we read, that those who have more may exercise uh, benevolence for those who have less, but at the same time that they may help those who are more destitute come up victorious and, and, and make a living. Yeah, so there is a whole work of education, not only giving for the poor. Yeah, right. in fact, in the Teacher's Quarterly, I like this line, it says, however, remember that as much as possible, the aim of charity is to motivate and enable the person to care for himself mm -hmm. or herself. Yes, yes. very I good. I really yes. like the way that was mm -hmm. put. Yeah, that, that's, that's a beautiful thought. Uh, when we read this morning's text from Matthew 25, uh, where it says, uh, he says to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. What immediately precedes that is the separation mm. of the sheep mm -hmm. from the goats. Now, the interesting thing in that story is that both Sheep and goats. So this is not believers and non-believers. These are all from the group of those who profess to be believers. Because mm. they said, you know, when, when he talks to, to, to those on his left hand, 
you know, he says, well, you know, I was hungry and you didn't feed me and, you know, I was naked, you didn't clothe me and I, you know, I was in prison, you didn't come to visit me. And they said, when did we see you like that? So he's talking to, about those who are affiliating themselves with Christ. And he says, when you, didn't, when you didn't do it for the least of these, you didn't do it to me. Mm. On the other hand, when he says to those on his right hand, the sheep, come, you know, and inherit the kingdom, uh, they said, well, when he says, you, you, you fed me and you clothed me and you came to visit me mm -hmm. and when I was sick, you took care of me. And, and they said, well, when did we see you like that? Mm -hmm. And his response was, when you did it to the least of these, you did it, did to, it me. to me. Exactly. And so he, he here is identifying himself with those who are downtrodden and dispossessed. And he demonstrates in this parable that it is our, a part of our ministry to reach out yes. to those who are less fortunate than we are. Amen. And if I may say about that very specific thing, uh, she points out in Desire of Ages, she says um, uh, in the, about that story, and he represented its decision as turning upon one point. When the nations are gathered before him, there'll be two classes, just what you were showing, mm -hmm. and, their, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or neglected to do for yeah. him in the person of the poor and suffering. Yeah. So that's just turning upon one point. Yes, yes. That, and that's it. And you know, even though the lesson doesn't bring it up, uh, there is an important chapter that should have been included here, which is Isaiah 58. Uh -huh. Because in Isaiah 58, uh, we don't have time to go into the details of this passage, but this passage is addressed specifically for Seventh-day Adventists. Actually, Ellen White says that in mm -hmm. Testimonies to Ministers. Um, we have Isaiah 58 in the context of the investigative judgment. But there is a problem with the group in that chapter. Mm -hmm. The problem is that they have fallen into formalism. They were into the ceremonies, the fasting, the praying, mm -hmm. the afflicting their souls. But God says, I don't accept your formalism because even though, and let me put it in my own words, <laughs> your theology is right, your experience is wrong. Yes. Because they were with all these things, but they were not helping the poor. They were not uh, clothing the naked. And, and, and the list goes on, the true fast that yeah. we know. So the remedy for a sleeping lukewarm church is to be involved in this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, now we're gonna look at uh, some examples uh, that we find in scripture uh, for those who uh, had access to wealth and how they experienced the, the grace of God in dealing with those who were less fortunate than they were. And we'll start off in Matthew uh, 19, uh, 16 to 22. And maybe uh, if you would read that for us, Sister Jeannie. Okay, sure. That's uh, 19 of Matthew, uh -huh. verses 16 to 22. Now behold, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit, uh, that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love the Lord, your, love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. <laughs> so here, I can't remember if it was you or Jeannie who mentioned that, you know, Jesus says, well, your, your theology may be correct, but your practice <laughs> is off base. Yeah. And here he's speaking to this rich young ruler who is a follower of Christ mm -hmm. because he says, I, I want to inherit eternal life. And, uh, and he says, what, when, when, when he asks, what, what shall I do? And Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. It's interesting. He, he, 
he, he reads off, I mean, he quotes off a list, uh, omitting some, <laughs> one in particular. And I was going to mention yeah, that. Yeah, one yes. in particular. <laughs> and then he includes it by, well, the young man says, well, I've, 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 I've kept these. They had no problem. We're good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, well, then sell all you have and give it to the poor. Mm. And, and, and this directly struck at, the, at one of the commandments that he had not quoted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is the 10th commandment. Yes. It, it, you know, Jesus was giving him the opportunity to acknowledge that he was lacking one thing. Mm -hmm. And Jesus, not, not because Jesus didn't know the 10 commandments, but Jesus purposely left out quoting the 10th, mm -hmm. which was because this was exactly his problem. Yeah. And, on, and of all the 10 commandments, the, the tenth is the only one that strikes at the heart if we take them to the letter. Mm. Because you can judge, you know, thou shall not um, kill, you can judge externally. Yes. And the other ones, you can judge them externally. But covetousness, you cannot judge it externally. Covetousness is a heart problem. Yes, yes. Jean, did you have something you wanted to add? I, to yeah, well, this is really good. She's, uh, she's Ellen White, um, it talks about, this is in manuscripts. Um, did not Christ know what a struggle that ruler would have? He did, and as soon as he should consent to place his feet in the footsteps of his Lord, then through grace given him, the way would be made easy. I really mm. like that. This is the course all must pursue to obtain the prize of a home in God's kingdom, a possession that will never pass away. So he, she, she said he knew that amputation must be made. <laughs> I, like what, I like what she says, to save his soul from selfish mm. indulgence and the sure result of transgression. Selfishness is a great sin. Yeah, mm. I, I reflect on the, on the text where Jesus says, you know, if, if, if your right hand offends you, cut it yes. off. Because it's better to enter into the kingdom. Amputation. <laughs> as an amputee, mm -hmm. because all things are restored there. <laughs> Everything is whole, mm -hmm. but it's better to get there with excising whatever you have to because on the other side of it is everything and more than you could ever imagine or dream of. You know, this rich young ruler that we don't know the name, and that's significant because Ellen White says that Jesus really desired this guy to be part of his team. Mm -hmm. And actually, I like how Mark puts it. When Jesus saw him, he loved him. Mm -hmm. he, he could have been one of the key figures in the New Testament. Perhaps he would have, been, he would have become a writer of some of the books in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. He had great talent and he had great uh, possessions. But this man, this young person, he missed the opportunity. Yes. And because of that, he didn't leave a story to tell not even a name to share right, right. because of that. But we see, it's not mentioned in the lesson, um, someone opposite to him, Mary Magdalene, mm -hmm. that she was decided to give it all for Jesus. Yes. And now her name was immortalized. Yes. And Jesus said, wherever this gospel is preached, the story of this woman will also be preached about what she did. Now, we started off the lesson talking about uh, some of the twisted kind of theological thoughts yes. that were ingrained in, in, in the Jewish mindset at the time, in the Hebrew mindset. And, and Jesus addresses it here in, in Matthew uh, 19, at, at verse 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, after the rich young ruler goes away, assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven and again, I say to you, it's easier for that camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? <laughs> <laughs> the rich are supposed to be the blessed of God. Hmm. If they are struggling to make it in, what chance do we have? Mm -hmm. and, and this is, 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 is part of that, the, the twisted thinking, the distorted thinking of that day. Yes. That Jesus came to undo so that we could be liberated to think and act like he thought and acted. And in doing so, recreate in, in us the image of Christ. Now, then, Pastor Daniel, is it important that we all become impoverished 
to enter the kingdom? Should we all sell everything that we have and become destitute to enter the kingdom? Of course not. This is not the point here. Um, Jesus asks this man to give of his money because that was his God. Mm -hmm. That was his idol. But he didn't ask everyone the same sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, to Jesus, uh, to, to Jesus, to Peter, Peter, he had to leave the nets, the, sh the, the boats that he had. Mm -hmm. This man had to leave his money. Yes. But others, like Job, that we'll study later, uh, even though he was tested, but uh, God didn't ask him to, to renounce to all his wealth, actually blessed him even more. So um, discipleship has to do with leaving whatever separates me yes. from God. To some people, like the rich young ruler, that was money. For others, it might be something else. All right. It says, uh, she says in, the, in another manuscript, she says, God calls upon his people to turn from the earthly to the heavenly, to yield up to him his own. Nothing that they have is theirs. And that's what we have to realize. Right. Uh, they, they themselves are not their own for the word, uh, God's word declares you're not your own, you're bought with a price. So, so we have to realize, we, if we, we have to come from that attitude that we ourselves are not our own, we're God's and everything we have is God's. Very good, very good. Now we want to move on to another character, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Zacchaeus, and we find his story in Luke uh, chapter 19. I'll, I'll read uh, just a few verses of it. Uh, chapter 19, verse 1, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. <laughs> and he sought to see Jesus, uh, who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see, to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must stay at your house. Now, the, from here, the story develops where Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus and interacts with Zacchaeus mm. and... Because of this interaction in, in, chap, in, in chapter 19, verse 8, Zacchaeus makes a proclamation. Are, are you there at, yes. that, at that verse, yes. Jeannie? Uh -huh. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Okay, and, and just read verse 9 while we're there. Uh -huh. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. All right, beautiful, beautiful. And so now we find this contrast between two wealthy people, yes. the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. And when Zacchaeus is in the presence of Christ and as he interacts with Christ, he is, he is impressed that it is not important anymore to have his wealth elevated and and it, it, you know he alludes to the idea that some of some of his gain has been ill gain ill gotten mm -hmm. <laughs> he has perhaps taken more than than was required which was common which with was tax common. collectors yes yes mm -hmm. and that's why that's, the jews hated them exactly <laughs> because they extracted for rome but also for themselves mm -hmm. yeah and so uh he says, half of my goods I give to the poor. Hmm. That's, you know, if he's a wealthy man, could you imagine Bill Gates saying, half of my wealth, I'm going to give it to the poor. Hmm. That's a lot of money. Yes. And a substantial decrease in his net worth. Right. Yeah, it's interesting um, that Ellen White actually says that Zacchaeus had heard John the Baptist call to repentance. Mm -hmm. so he had a little background. His heart was being prepared. Yes. Um, when he, so he had, he had heard these messages. And so he was, actually, he was actually prepared in his heart. And now hearing the words reported to have come from the great teacher, he felt that uh, he was a sinner in the sight of God. So it had, this Holy Spirit had been working on him. Yet uh, what he had heard of Jesus kindled hope in his heart. Uh, repentance, reformation of life was possible even to him. Yes. Uh, not one, uh, was not one of the teacher's most trusted disciples, a publican. And so he was, he was very happy that Jesus uh, gave him an opening for hope. Yes, 
Yes. yes, exactly. And so he says, half of my wealth I give to the poor. And, and if I've taken anything from anyone, yeah. Yeah, unjustly, I, I will restore it fourfold. This is a big hit on his pocket. Yes, exactly. It's a big hit on his pocket. And, but, uh, he, but, but his encounter with Jesus is life-changing. Yeah, exactly. go on. So this is an evidence that Zacchaeus was a converted man mm -hmm. because his works showed that he had truly repented. Uh, there is a law in the Old Testament, the law of restitution. Yes. And usually this, is, this was um, uh, attached to the sin offerings that whoever um, may have defrauded a brother or sin against a brother, then he would not only bring a sin offering, but he would also um, restitute Mm -hmm. part of the damage that he had given. I think it was 5%. I, I don't yes. remember very well. So anyways, but he's even given more, giving more than, than, yes. than the 5% <laughs> that he was supposed, he was supposed to restore. Right. Uh, he's, he's given fourfold, uh, as it says here in the Bible, to those whom he had stolen from. And the fourfold, I found this interesting. The fourfold actually came from scripture, from 2 Samuel 12. Um, um, it's, this is from Ellen White. She says, in restoring fourfold for what he had taken in extortion, uh -huh. he was following the word of the prophet when he had said, he shall restore the lamb fourfold. That was David, David. Uh -huh. talking to Nathan. Yes. Uh, he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Good point. Yeah, so mm. that's interesting. Excellent point, yeah. Yeah, Th this, this, is, uh, this, this speaks to the idea of how how we, how we can be changed when we come into contact with the Christ. Mm -hmm. How our perspective and our priorities change when we align ourselves with Christ. Uh, it's no more how much can I get, yes. but how much can I help. Amen. Yeah, just as Christ gave all for us, mm -hmm. it influences us to give uh, to the cause of Christ. And part of the cause of Christ is helping those who are poor, needy, and dispossessed. Amen. Now, before we end, we, we must speak of Job. We, we have to. And uh, here, uh, Job, uh, in the book of Job, uh, there is something that God says to Job to, to just frame who Job is. Mm -hmm. And so in chapter one of Job, verse eight, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. evil. So th this is what God says about Job. And so he, he's, giving, he's giving Job a pretty high marks. <laughs> I owe yeah. that, that he could say that about each of us. But, that's a pretty uh, good compliment. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's quite a compliment for yes. God to say that, um, that, that you, know, you, you're, you, you run from evil and that you only want to do good in your life. <laughs> but, when we, um, but when we see how Job lives his life, then we get a fuller picture of who the man Job is. And so I think um, in Job 29, and uh, Pastor Govea, maybe you can grab that Pastor Miranda. Miranda, uh, not Govea. Pastor Miranda. <laughs> well, both of you are my pastors. <laughs> and you both speak Spanish. <laughs> Although The confusion Portuguese. is because of the Daniel. The Daniels, yes, yes, yes. So Pastor Daniel, I should just call you Pastor Daniel. <laughs> okay. If you can get Job uh, 29, 12 through 16. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll see some of how the character of Job uh, plays out. Okay, we're going to read from the New King James Version. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness that it clothed me in a practical way. Uh, my justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. You know, this is interesting because yes. he didn't only waited for the poor to come to him, 
but he searched out the case that he did not know. That's right. He was looking for people to help. That's they right. didn't, he didn't expect them to come to him. Yes, yes. I mean, this, this speaks of something about Job's character. Yes, I, li I like this last paragraph where Ellen White suggested, Don't, do not wait for them, the poor, to call mm -hmm. your attention to, to their needs. As, act as did Job. The thing that he knew he, not, he searched out. Go on an inspecting tour and learn what is needed <laughs> and how it best be supplied. Wow. Maybe yeah, like that. precious. Yeah. Yeah, th these, these, um, these, should, these statements should, should all bring us pause uh, because off, it's so often that, you know, on Sabbath we, we put in our tithes and our offerings and, and, and sometimes we walk away feeling justified and good that we, you know, we gave to missions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. Although our mission offering now has decreased significantly in the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really a very small percentage of our offerings. It used to be one of the major uh, areas where Adventists gave, and now it's, it's dwindled almost down to, I mean, it's good that we give to missions, for sure, mm -hmm. but we've lost sight of that. But we, you know, we give to missions and we feel good about it. But here, you know, God has something different mm -hmm. in mind for us. Not just that we put money in, but that we are actively involved on a personal level with doing this work. That we invest part of our time, our energy, and our resources in helping those who are dispossessed. Mm -hmm. Because there is a blessing, as you read earlier, there is a blessing for us in helping those who are less fortunate. Yes. I, I mean, I like jo uh, John 8, 36, where it says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. And so if we follow this and we do as Christ did, that's true freedom, even though it doesn't seem like it is mm. to the world. Yes. Yeah, many would question uh, why would you, would you give of your means, your hard-earned dollars, mm -hmm. uh, in support of those who, who are dispossessed? Our time. Our time, mm -hmm. yeah, our energies. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that it is a part of being Christ-like. It is what we are called to do and because we understand that whatever we have, whatever resources we have, belong to God anyway, mm. <laughs> we're just managing it till he comes. Yes. Yeah, that's our job, to manage it till he comes. And so if we can manage it like he managed, then we're on to something. Amen. I, I often... Uh, you reflect of some time that I spent with some friends of mine who uh, had means, and I learned from them. And we should spend time with Christ so that we learn from Him as well. Now, for those of you listening on, God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you next Sabbath with our next exciting episode. As we conclude our Sabbath school service and we begin the worship service, we want to ask the Lord to be especially present with us as we study His Word and as we sing praises to His name. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, we come before Your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus. We ask that You will bless us with Your presence as we prepare now to enter the worship service. We ask that You will edify us and that You will help us honor and glorify Your name. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus heals a man at the pool of Bethesda. The healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda took place in a city called Jerusalem. The city was surrounded by stone uh, walls all around. The pool of Bethesda was near the sheep gate where the temple sheep were washed for sacrifice. This pool had five porches around it. Well, Jesus went into the city and he saw a pool of water called Bethesda. Many people would come to the pool and lie beside it. They thought that an angel would come down and stir the waters. That's what they believed. When this happened, the first person who got into the water would be healed. That was their thought. 
Now people could not walk or see, and people who were very sick were lying beside the pool. And you can see in this picture, there's people around the pool. And some <clears throat> were, uh, they, some were, couldn't walk, some were blind, some were just ill. But this man down here, he couldn't walk. He was the paralytic man. So Jesus saw this man and he had no one to help him. He felt sorry for him. His people who could not walk or see were there, but this man was, he felt very bad for him because it had been 38 years since he was able to, um, that he had been there. So when Jesus saw the man, he said, he said, do you want to get well? Sir, the man said, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, and while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes in front of me and ahead of me and I could not go in. It's been 38 years. Jesus felt so bad for him. He had a tender heart for him. Jesus says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man got up and walked. The people who saw the man said, hmm, it is the Sabbath. And the law forbids for you to carry your mat. They weren't even excited that he was walking after 38 years. But the man replied, well, the man made me well. And he said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Who told you to pick up your mat and walk? Those men said. The religious leader said. And the man who healed Jesus had no idea who he was and who had healed him. He had no idea. But later that day, Jesus found him at the temple. And after the man told everyone who asked him that it was Jesus, he found out it was Jesus that healed him and made him well. And the people <clears throat> didn't want Jesus to do these things on the Sabbath. They were just making up rules. And that wasn't the, what Jesus would want. Jesus wants to heal even on Sabbath. They said, oh, it's against the law to heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus said, my father works every day. And so do I. I always tell others about God on the Sabbath, no matter what day it is. And the people were mad because Jesus did not follow their laws, their made up laws, their rules, not God's. He said that God was his father and Jesus knew that these people did not believe in him, that he was the God's son. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word believes him. Um, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. You know, oh, the Jews ignored the miracle and took issue with the fact that the man was healed on the Sabbath. But Jesus made it clear that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, not those men. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, we don't know the exact nature of this man's ailment that was paralyzed, but Jesus healed him, healed him, regardless how many years he had been ill. God can do anything because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He can do all things. Jesus, it's God's son, and he cares for people who are sick, and he cares for everyone. So we just ask him to be with us and to heal us and to help us in time of need. God is the Lord of the Sabbath.
Psalm TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for healthful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Sum TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Today we are going to study a very important subject, and the title of it is The Cities of Refuge. But before we do, we are going to pray as we should do every time that we're going to open God's Word. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before you with humility, realizing that our knowledge is so incomplete. Therefore, we plead that the Spirit who inspired your word will come to explain it to us and to empower to us to live by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. We thank you for the privilege of prayer and we claim the promise that you will answer when we come in faith because we ask it in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Let's begin our study at the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and verses 45 through 47, where we are told that the entire Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. It reads like this, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. Here Jesus is speaking. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, Jesus says, for he, that is Moses, wrote about me. So the writings of Moses are saturated with Jesus Christ. Ellen White in Desire of Ages, page 211, wrote these incredible words about how the Old Testament on every page reveals Jesus Christ. It reads like this, In every page, whether history or precept or prophecy, the Old Testament scriptures are irradiated with the glory of the Son of God. So far as it was of divine institution, the entire system of Judaism was a compacted prophecy of the gospel. Desire of Ages, page 211. So Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. Today we're going to study one of those episodes in the writings of Moses. We're going to take a look at the cities of refuge, which are a type or an illustration in miniature of Jesus Christ. Now let me give you the sources where we find a description of the cities of refuge. They are found in Numbers 35, Deuteronomy 19, Joshua 20, Deuteronomy 4, 41 to 43, and in the Spirit of Prophecy, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 515 through page 517. In the cultures of iniquity, when one person killed another, the next of kin was required to avenge the death of his relative by finding the slayer and putting the slayer to death. The result was that during the rest of the slayer's life, he was not safe anywhere. He lived in constant fear that the avenger might find him and put him to death. The slayer's life was one of constant worry, anxiety, and unrest, and fear. He could not sleep well at night for fear that the avenger was on his track. There was no escape from a life of flight, anxiety, and fear. The situation of the slayer appeared to be hopeless. Now God took this custom from antiquity and he adds something where the slayer could find refuge from the avenger. God added an element to this practice that existed in biblical times. God, in other words, did not abolish the custom, but rather added an element where the slayer could find peace 
and security within a city of refuge. God set up six cities of refuge where the slayer could flee and be safe from the wrath of the avenger. As long as the slayer made it to the city, before the avenger could find him, he was safe. Now let's notice the number and names of the cities. In Joshua chapter 20, verses 7 through 9, we have the names of the cities and the place where they were located. It says there in Joshua chapter 20 and verse 7, So they appointed Kadesh in Galilee, in the mountains of Naphtali, Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim, and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountains of Judah. And on the other side of the Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness on the plain, for the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for all the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwelt among them, that whoever killed a person, and now comes a very important word, whoever killed a person accidentally might flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Now it's interesting to notice the location of these particular cities that we just named from Joshua chapter 20 and verses 7 through 9. These cities were Bezer, which was southeast of the Jordan, Ramoth Gilead, which was central and east of the Jordan, and Golan, which was northeast of the Jordan. The other cities, Kadesh, was northwest of the Jordan, Shechem was central west of the Jordan, and Hebron was southwest of the Jordan. So were there three cities east of the Jordan, three cities west, and they were north, central, and south on both sides. The location of these cities is important because no one was more than a half day's journey from any of these cities. There was quick access to these cities from anywhere in Israel. God chose these cities purposely because they were equally distributed and people had quick access to them because the avenger would be on the track of the slayer. Now, what about provisions in the cities? All of these cities were Levitical cities, in other words, cities of the priesthood in Israel. The priests were the intercessors, as we know, and the protectors of the refugees that came to these cities. In other words, the priests interceded in behalf of man. Numbers chapter 35 and verse 6 tells us something about the priestly nature of these cities. It says there in Numbers 35 verse 6, now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities of refuge to which a manslayer may flee. So very clearly, these were cities of the Levites where the slayer who slew someone accidentally could flee from the wrath of the avenger. Now these cities had ample provi provisions for the refugees. The Levites, as we know, received one-tenth from each of the 11 tribes. This was the tithe that was given to the Levites for their service. In this way, the Levites received 11 tenths from the other tribes, while the other tribes only kept nine tenths. This gave 11 tenths to the Levites, and thus they had an abundance of provisions with which to feed, clothe and lodge those who fled to the cities for protection as an asylum. Now the question is, what was the purpose of these cities? Well, the slayer could flee and seek protection and security in any of these cities from the evil intentions of the avenger. They could find this security only in the city of refuge. God established the cities of refuge uh, uh, who killed 
by mistake or error or accidentally. Those who killed intentionally with a high hand, knowingly, in other words, those who murdered, had no right to seek protection in the cities. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verses 4 through 6, where we find a description of those who could legitimately find security, refuge, and peace in the cities. Deuteronomy 19 verse 4 through verse 6. And this is the case of the manslayer who, fe who flees there, that he may live. Whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally, not having hated him in pa time past, as when, now comes an example, as when a man goes to the woods with his neighbor to cut timber, and his hand swings a stroke with the axe to cut down a tree, and the head of the axe slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. That's an accidental uh, uh, death. He shall flee, it continues saying, to one of these cities and live, lest the avenger of blood, while his anger is hot, pursue the manslayer and overtake him, because the way is long, and kill him, though he was not deserving of death, since he had not hated the victim in time past. So notice, anyone who had committed uh, an act of uh, causing the death of someone accidentally or unintentionally could legitimately remain in these cities. But those who sinned with a high hand, knowingly because they hated their neighbor and they executed the neighbor, those individuals, they could come to the city of refuge, but we're going to notice a little later on in our study that a process was followed to determine if that person had a right to remain in the city or not. Now the slayer needed to flee immediately and urgently to one of the cities of refuge. There was no time to bid farewell to the family or to take care of family business. The slayer's life was in jeopardy as long as he was not within the confines of the city of refuge. The fugitive had to sacrifice every other interest in order to make it to safely, safety in the city. The slayer could not uh, allow fatigue, weariness, or whatever to slow him down. He had to ignore all difficulties and obstacles. There could be no detours, no stops, no delays were possible, because if the avenger reached the slayer outside the city, the slayer's life was in peril. Now, what was the nature of the roads that led to the cities? Well, the roads were always kept in good order. God instructed Israel to build access roads to the cities of refuge, and they were always to keep the access roads in tip-top shape for easy access. Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 3 says, You shall prepare roads for yourself and divide into three parts the territory of your land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, that any manslayer may flee there. So roads were to be prepared so that an individual who wanted to flee to the cities could arrive without stumbling. Holes in the road were filled, were filled, rocks were removed. This was no time for an ankle sprain or a broken foot. The fugitive could not lose an instant in his race to the place of rest and protection. All along the road, there were signposts that read REFUGE in large, clear letters. The letters were so large that as Habakkuk says, one who runs can read it. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 2. Now some people, out of pure meanness, would sometimes change the signposts at the intersections, and others would place obstacles on the road to make it harder for the fugitive to reach the city. This might mean sure death for the person who was fleeing to the cities. 
Now, who were the beneficiaries of the cities? The cities were accessible to all, not only Hebrews, but also pilgrims and even foreigners. There was no monopoly or divine right for the Jews alone. Notice Numbers chapter 35 and verse 15. These six cities shall be for refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally may flee there. So notice the cities were available to everyone, not only to the children of Israel, but also to the stranger and to the sojourner among the children of Israel. Now let's talk about the moment when the slayer arrived in the city. Upon arriving, undoubtedly the fugitive was very tired, but he had to present himself before the elders and the high priest, not a common ordinary priest. He had to present himself before the elders and before the high priest. And probably this happened at the altar of sacrifice, although it's not absolutely certain. In Joshua chapter 20, verse 2, verse 3, and verse 5, we find these words about the arrival of the refugee to the city. It says there, And when he flees to one of those cities, and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city, and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city. Notice that there were witnesses over and above the high priest. So once again, when he flees to one of those cities, and stands at the entrance of the gate of the city, and declares his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city as one of them, and give him a place, that he may dwell among them. Then, if the avenger of blood pursues him, they shall not deliver the slayer into his hand, because he struck his neighbor unintentionally, but did not hate him beforehand. So once the slayer was within the confines of the city of refuge, the avenger had no access to him. The individual was protected by the high priest, and by the elders who met him at the door of the city. However, we need to go a step further. After the fugitive found refuge in the city, an impartial jury presided by the high priest sat to examine the evidence to see if the slayer had truly committed an accidental act. In other words, the slayer was innocent until proven guilty when he appeared before the high priest and the jury. It was to be determined if the person was guilty of premeditated, purposeful, open, high-handed sin or accidental sin due to human limit limitations, frailty or weakness. The slayer was in the city under the high priest's protection until an impartial judgment determined whether the slayer had the right to remain in the city. The court verdict only confirmed the right of the person to asylum or denied that right based on an examination of his past behavior. In other words, there was an investigative judgment to see if the person truly deserved to be in the city of refuge. Now let's read the Bible description of this. Joshua chapter 20 and verse 6, And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the one who is the high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. So notice, he had to stand before the congregation for judgment. He could remain in the city until his case was examined in the judgment. Notice also Numbers 35, verse 12, verses 24 and verse 25. It says, They shall be cities of refuge for you, 
from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. So notice this, he was secure in the city, protected by the high priest and by the elders of the city until he stood in the judgment. And if it was determined by an examination of the evidence that his sin had been unintentional or accidental, he was allowed to remain in the city. If not, he was given into the hand of the avenger, as we're going to notice in a few moments. So it says, They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger, that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. Then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood according to these judgments. I can imagine the avenger being outside the city and say, he's mine, he killed my relative. And I can imagine the high priest say, let's wait a minute until we examine the evidence to see if your accusations are true. Notice verse 25. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer <clears throat> from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall return him to the city of refu refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Now the judgment was very interesting. It needed to be, uh, the evidence needed to be 100% true for the individual either to remain within the city or to be given to the avenger. One witness in the judgment could not determine the result of the judgment. More, there needed more than one witness. witness. No matter how powerful the circumstantial evidence against the fugitive was, he could not be convicted based on the testimony of one witness. Numbers 35 verses 30 and 31 reads like this, Whoever kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the testimony of witnesses. But one witness is not sufficient testimony against a person for the death penalty. Moreover, you shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. If the slayer was not guilty, he had absolutely nothing to fear. The high priest would protect him, the elders would protect him, he could remain safe and sound inside the city. However, if he was guilty, and he presumptuously claimed the right to be in the city of refuge, he faced an ominous future. Now, all the while, the avenger was waiting outside the city, claiming the right to destroy the accused, and demanding that the fugitive be handed over to him. In case a person claimed the protection and refuge of the city was lying, and was presumptuously claiming the right to protection, he was handed over to the avenger to be destroyed. The city and the high priest could provide no security for such a person. The blood of the sacrifice on the altar could no, not atone for such a person who was taking advantage of the city while he had committed high-handed, knowing sin against known light. Let's read Numbers chapter 35, verses 16 to 21, where we find the details that we just described. But if he strikes him with an iron implement, so that he dies, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he strikes him with a stone in the hand, by which one could die, and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he strikes him with a wooden hand weapon by which one could die, and he does die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death. This is a solemn thought, folks. In other words, if the person presumptuously claimed the protection of the city, when that person had committed known sin with a high hand, he was delivered to the avenger to be destroyed. Verse 19 says, The avenger of blood himself shall put the murderer to death. And 
When he meets him, he shall put him to death. If he pushes him out of hatred or while lying in wait, hurls something at him so that he dies, or in enmity he strikes him with his hands so that he dies, the one who struck him shall surely be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. Now what would happen if a witness lied about uh, the individual who was accused? Notice Deuteronomy chapter 19 verses 18 and 19. It says there, And he and the judges shall make careful, careful inquiry, and indeed, if the witness is a false witness who has testified falsely against his brother, then you shall do to him as he thought to have done to his brother. So you shall put away the evil from among you. This is really something. In other words, if a, fa if a false witness testified against the individual who was in the city of refuge, that person was to suffer the penalty that the slayer supposedly was going to suffer. Now, if the court of law pronounced the refugee not guilty, was the refugee secure forever? Was he once secure, always secure? If innocent, he could remain rightfully in the city and be safe. However, only by abiding or remaining within the confines of the city of refuge under the protection of the high priest could he be secure and in full peace. Now you say, so he had to stay in the city of refuge forever and ever and ever? No, not necessarily. We're going to notice that there was a certain point when the individual could leave the city of refuge and go home. If at any time the refugee decided to abandon the prescribed limits of the city and the avenger found him, he might have to pay for his negligence with his life. He could not leave the city even for an instant. Nostalgia for his family, his friends, his work, his possessions, and the comforts of home might entice him, yet he must abide within the city. It was a case of one, it was a case of one secure, always secure, as long as he chose to remain within the city of refuge. Notice Numbers chapter 35 and verses 26 to 28, where we find the details that I just described. But if the manslayer at any time goes outside the city, the limits of the city of refuge where he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the limits of his city of refuge, and the avenger, the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood, because, notice this, because he should have remained in his city of refuge un, until a certain point, this is a key point, until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. In other words, because the high priest died, he could return to his home, his lost home. Notice Joshua chapter 20 and verse 6, where we find described the return home. It says, And he shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the slayer may return and come to his own city and his own house to the city from which he fled. And then, because the high priest had died, then he could return to his long lost home. Now, why did God give uh, all of this information that we just took a look at? Well, the reason is that the cities of refuge were a type, a type of Christ and our relationship to Jesus Christ. I want to read another uh, passage that we find in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, uh, we're going to read chapter 24, Luke chapter 24 
and we'll read verses 25 through 27. Luke 24, 25 through 27. This is as Jesus is walking to Emmaus with his two followers. And they said, we thought he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And notice what Jesus said to them. Verse 25, Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, which is where we're studying from, and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By the way, this verse is mentioning the three divisions of the Old Testament for the Jews in Christ's day. In the writings of Moses are the Torah, the prophets are the Nebi'im, and the scriptures are the Ketubim. So Jesus basically saying, the whole Old Testament speaks about me. Then a, bit, a little bit later on, Jesus met the disciples in the upper room. It's in the same chapter, chapter 24, and let's begin at verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. Notice who is at the center of the writings of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms. Verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So, all of the Old Testament is centered in Jesus Christ. The cities of refuge are an illustration of the refuge that we can find in Jesus. So let's now apply the typology that we find in the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. We have several symbols in the city of refuge. We have first of all the road that leads to the cities. Secondly, we have the city itself. And third, we have the high priest within the city. Now, as we know, we wouldn't be here if this wasn't true, man lost his Eden home due to sin. And now we flee for our lives from Satan, the avenger, Satan who wants to destroy us. We're tired of running, tired of fleeing. We long for peace, safety, security, and we can only find that security in Jesus Christ, the city of refuge. He is not far from us, as the cities were not far from the Israelites wherever they lived. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 27, I'm reading from the NIV, it says, God did this so that men would seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each of us. You see, Jesus, the city of refuge, is not far from each of us. Notice also Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 7. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, the cities had an abundant supply for the refugees who arrived there as we studied. In Christ, we not only find an abundance, but we find a super abundance of spiritual resources for feeding our soul and lodging our soul. Notice Ephesians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So in Jesus, there are exceedingly abundantly resources for those who come and flee to Him. Now what about the urgency of flight to the cities? We must cast aside anything that stands in the way in our flight to Jesus Christ because the avenger, Satan, is on our track. 
We cannot allow our jobs, our family ties, our friends, our possessions, and worldly pleasures to engross our attention. We must flee to Jesus, the city of refuge, immediately in order to escape the wrath of the avenger. We read in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, words very well known, I'm sure. If anyone comes to me, Jesus says, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, is Jesus telling, that we're, telling us that we're supposed to hate our father and our mother, our wife and our children, our brothers and our sisters, and our own life? That's not exactly what he's saying. What he's saying is that none of these things can take first place. None of these things can take the place of Jesus. We must flee to Jesus and not allow any distractions to keep us from going immediately to Him. Luke chapter 18, 29 and 30 also tells us about the urgency of fleeing to Jesus now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, now, because the avenger is on our track. Luke 18, 29 and 30 says, So he said to them, Assuredly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or parents, or brothers, or wife, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time, and in the age to come, eternal life. Detours, stops, and delays in coming to Jesus, the city of refuge, are dangerous. One minute from now may be too late because the avenger is constantly on our track to destroy us. We must come immediately to Jesus, the city of refuge. In Psalm 9, verse 9, we find these beautiful words, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Now what about the road that leads to Jesus? Well, the fact is the road is Jesus. Jesus is the city, Jesus is the high priest, and Jesus is the road, interestingly enough. Now, Jesus is the road that leads to the city of refuge, and the road is clear and easy to find. The Bible is the unerring guide that tells us what the road is that leads to the city. We must carry a road map and not only pay attention to the signs along the road. We must verify with Scripture that the road signs are pointing in the right direction. If there is any contradiction between the map to the cities, which is the Bible, the map to Jesus, and other signs that seem to lead to Jesus, we must allow the Bible to point us in the right direction. Ellen White wrote these very interesting words, A signpost was erected by God for those journeying through this world. So what has God placed? A signpost for those who are journeying through this world. One arm of this signpost pointed out willing obedience to the Creator as the road to felicity and life, while the other arm indicated disobedience as the path to misery and death. The way to happiness was as clearly defined as was the way to the city of refuge under the Jewish dispensation. She's referring to the cities of refuge. And then she says this, But in an evil hour for our race, the great enemy of all good turned the signpost around and multitudes have mistaken the way. Because they look at what seems to appear, what someone else says, or what they read somewhere. But the Bible is the only sure guide to Jesus Christ. We all know that verse in John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way. By the way, the word way is really the word road in Greek. It's hodos. I am the way, Jesus says, and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. By the way, Jesus is accessible to all. It doesn't matter what their race is. It doesn't matter what their nationality is. There is not a certain group that has a monopoly 
on coming to Christ, a monopoly on salvation. Everyone is welcome. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11, we find these beautiful words. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but all is all, but, but Christ is all and in all. So Jesus is of easy, easy access to every person that lives on earth. It doesn't matter what their race is, their nationality is. They, there's not one group that has a monopoly over Jesus, so to speak. Now, Jesus is not only the road. Jesus is also the high priest. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 and 15 that Jesus gives us refuge against the enemy and we can come boldly to Him in faith to receive mercy and grace. It says in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 and 15, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And now comes the counsel. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. And who is at the throne of grace? The high priest, Jesus Christ. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when we come to Jesus, Jesus receives us and He provides for us refuge. However, in our case there will also be an investigative judgment. Everyone who has come to Jesus, the city of refuge, claims protection of Jesus as their representative and as their intercessor. But the judgment will examine whether we were truly repentant, where we truly confessed our sins, whether we truly had faith and trust in Jesus. In other words, we can claim to find refuge in Jesus, but the judgment will reveal whether we really had a right to seek that refuge. Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verses 13 and 14. Here, the wise man Solomon, who for a period was kind of foolish, wrote this, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Like those who came to the city of refuge, we must stand before the judge for our actions to be examined to see if we have sinned with a high hand and not have, and we haven't come with repentance and with a confession and true faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So Jesus is a high priest. We can find protection and refuge in Him in the city, but we must stand before the judgment bar of Christ to see if our sins were sins uh, due to accident, due to human weakness, or whether they are sins with a high hand, knowingly going against light that God has provided for us. There is no provision for open and presumptuous sin against known light. Notice Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 to 31. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which dev will devour the adversaries. 
Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be uh, thought worthy those who have trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So be very careful not to claim Jesus as refuge while we are hanging on to known sin, sin that is against known light. Let's be very careful about presumptuously claiming Jesus while we have not truly come to Him in repentance, in confession, and in faith. Now the investigative judgment is a confirmatory judgment. The judgment does not change the person's status before God. It only shows if the person's claim is right and the person deserved the protection within the city of refuge. Now, the Bible tells us that one witness cannot lead to a person's demise. Well, the Bible tells us that there will be a great jury in heaven when each individual is judged before the high priest. All judgment has been committed to the Son by the Father. By the way, notice Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Here Daniel is describing the beginning of the judgment in 1844. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. By the way, notice it doesn't say that only one throne was placed. It says thrones were put in place. This is the heavenly jury. These are the seats of the jurors, and God will occupy the seat as judge. Who are the witnesses in this judgment? Well, angels, loyal angels, beings from other worlds, probably Moses, Elijah, and Enoch are present there. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Satan stands outside accusing those who have found refuge in Jesus. Notice Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And here it speaks about Joshua the high priest. It's not the same Joshua of the conqu conquest of the promised land. This is a different Joshua. But Joshua represents God's people, and Satan is accusing Joshua, and in that way he's really accusing the people that Joshua is standing in favor of. So notice Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. By the way, the angel of the Lord is Christ. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is, not, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now what happens if, if an individual has claimed to Jesus Christ as Savior, has claimed a right to be in the city of refuge, but the judgment shows that that person was not truly converted and only sought refuge to escape from the wrath of the avenger. Well, the Bible tells us that the time will come when the door of probation will close. Revelation chapter 22 verse 11 tells us that at the conclusion of the judgment, all cases have been decided, and by the way, at that point, the tares have been separated from the wheat. The tares are not the worldly people. The tares are individuals who claim to be believers. You see, in the church, there are good fish and bad fish. There are wise virgins and foolish virgins. There is wheat and there are also tares in the church. So in other words, this is referring to people who claimed to be believers, but 
their works in the judgment show that they were not true believers. They had not committed their lives fully and completely to the Lord. Notice Revelation 22 and verse 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And then those who have claimed to be followers of Jesus, but the judgment proved that they were not genuine believers, they will be handed over to the avenger, to the wicked one. In Great Controversy, page 614, Ellen White described what happens after the close of probation. The wicked have passed the boundary of their protection. The Spirit of God persistently resisted, has been at last withdrawn. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Now we know that Satan is a liar from the beginning, and he's a single witness that accuses God's people. Notice John chapter 8 and verse 44. Here Jesus said to the Jews that he was speaking to, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. As the judgment goes forward, Satan accuses God's faithful people who have come to Jesus the refuge. He says, they're mine because they were sinners. And Jesus the high priest will defend their right to be, so to speak, in the city of refuge. By the way, the judgment is not going to change anything. Let me just explain by using a couple of, a couple of illustrations. You know, in sports, there is what you call the instant replay. What is the purpose of the instant replay? Well, you know, the World Cup was recent, recent. And sometimes when it seems like the referee has made the wrong call, then the referee goes to a box and he sees the replay. Now let me ask you, what is the purpose of the replay? Is it to change the play? No. It's simply to show if the referee got the call right. In other words, the instant replay does not change the play. It's to see if the referee got the play correctly called. And so the investigative judgment is not going to change anyone's cases. In the investigative judgment, it's simply going to show who truly believed in Jesus and who didn't. It is a judgment review, in other words, an investigation to see if the, prov pro pro uh, the provision was claimed truly by the believer. Now, so if we've come to Jesus and we are secure in the city of refuge, spiritually speaking today, are we once secure, always secure? And the answer is yes. As long as we abide in Him, the city of refuge, we are safe. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10, Abide in me and I in you. Abide means to stay in the city of refuge. It's the, coming to the city of refuge is not a visit. It is an abiding within the city of refuge. It is an abiding in Jesus Christ. It is remaining in Him. I might give you an illustration that I've used in previous presentations, so if you would heard it, it'll just be a review. When I was a kid, I used to collect butterflies. I lived in the country of Venezuela where they have beautiful tropical butterflies. And I would go to this national park and uh, they had just spectacular, these blue butterflies uh, that kind of shone when they flo flew through the air. They had uh, butterflies that had numbers on the back of their wings, believe it or not. They had uh, butterflies that always sit on the tree trunk upside down. They have two eyes like an owl because that way they protect themselves from the birds. So I collected butterflies at that time. And uh, 
you know, I would go to this national park uh, with my jar that had carbon tetrachloride and with my net and I would catch the butterflies and I would put the butterflies in the jar. By the way, I don't do it anymore. Uh, whenever I, I teach the uh, Pathfinder Honor, I have them color butterflies because I don't think that we should really be killing the creatures of God. Uh, that was in my very youngest years. But anyway, I would put the butterfly inside the jar where the carbon tetrachloride was and the butterfly would die almost instantly. And then I would take the butterfly, I would put a pin through its body and I would mount it on uh, wood until it dried and then I would add it to my collection. Well, several years after I went back to the National Park because it wasn't uh, in the city of Caracas where we lived. We had to travel probably about three hours to get to this place where the National Park was. Several years passed. We didn't go there, but then we, we returned once. And um, when we returned, I had my net and I had my jar and I had all everything I needed for uh, catching butterflies and mounting them. And as I was entering into the, uh, into the National Park, uh, the ranger who was there said, uh, where are you going with, uh, with that net? I said, well, I'm going to catch butterflies. He said, uh, no, you're not going to catch butterflies. I said, but I used to come here to catch butterflies all the time. He said, no, but since then, this park has been declared by the government a national refuge, and you cannot catch anything. You cannot kill anything. You can't pick anything off a tree. Uh, you can't take any plants. Everything is protected in this national park. Now, it's interesting, the first time that I went to that park, uh, there was these beautiful blue butterflies, large, they're called morphos. They would fly through the air. They didn't fly straight, they would go up and down, up and down. And, uh, you know, the first time that I tried to catch one of those butterflies, I had my net and I was running through the, through the jungle because it's a jungle-like area, a tropical rainforest, and I would swing at the butterfly, he would go down, I would swing and he would go up, and I just just about killed myself going after the butterfly and I wasn't able to catch him. And I noticed that the individual who took care of the park uh, kind of was smiling and I said, uh, you know, wh why are you smiling? He says, why are you killing yourself trying to catch those butterflies? I said, well, you know, because I'm a, a butterfly collector, they're beautiful and I want, to add to, I want to add them to my collection. He says, yeah, but you don't have to run after them and bump into trees and uh, stumble over rocks. There's a very easy way in which you can catch those butterflies. I said, oh, really? Uh, what, give me the secret. He said, all you have to do is go to the store and buy a super ripe banana and take the banana and throw it on the ground and leave it there for about a half an hour and then come back in a half an hour and see what happens. I said, does that really work? He said, you better believe it. So we went to the store, probably about 10 minutes away, bought some bananas, brought the bananas, put a banana on the ground, left for a half an hour, and when I came back, there were five of those blue butterflies sitting on the banana. I took my net, put my net over them, and I added them to my collection. You see, I was the avenger. But when I came back to the national park, and they would not allow me to catch butterflies, the ranger said, no way, it's a national refuge now. So I thought to myself, this is a piece of cake. All I have to do is go outside the fence of the national park and I'll throw my banana on the ground and if any butterfly risks coming over the fence and sitting on the banana, I will catch that butterfly, put it into the carbon tetrachloride and add it to my collection. And that's exactly what I did put a banana on the ground, came back, and there were several of those butterflies there, and I caught them and added them to my collection. You see, when we come to Jesus, the city of refuge, and remain in Him, abide in Him, inside the city, we are absolutely safe. But if at any, at any point we decide to abandon our connection with Jesus, our city of refuge, so to speak, we are on dangerous ground because the hunter is after us to destroy us. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now is there any time, folks, 
when we can be eternally secure from the power of the avenger and go back to our home? Yes. The Bible tells us that it is when the high priest dies. Now, this doesn't mean that when Jesus dies in heaven, then we're going to go to heaven and we're going to live forever, uh, we're going to live there for a thousand years and then come back to the earth and live forever here while Jesus is dead. I think the point that Moses is making here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is that it was the death of the high priest that guarantees that someday we will return to our everlasting home. Jesus said, the meek will inherit the earth. The death of Jesus sealed the final destruction of the avenger or the accuser for being a false witness. Our eternal security we owe to the shed blood of Jesus, our high priest, which guarantees the destruction of the avenger as a false witness and us returning to our long lost Eden home. Isn't this a beautiful illustration of Jesus as we find it in the Old Testament? Many Christians say, we're New Testament Christians. You Adventists, you are Old Testament Christians. Listen folks, you cannot in any way understand the New Testament without the Old, or the Old without the New. Saint Augustine once said, the Old the new is in the old concealed, and the old is in the new revealed. They both work together. They both point to Jesus Christ. They teach us lessons concerning salvation and perdition. So the question is, as we come to an end today, have you found refuge in Jesus? Are you abiding in Jesus Christ day in and day out? Or have you not come to Jesus? Or have you gone outside the city of refuge where Satan might have access to you. That's a decision that we have to make and I call upon you and upon everyone who is watching. If you're not in the city of refuge, come. Jesus is waiting with open arms. And if you go, have left the city of refuge, please come back to Jesus and abide in Him so that when Jesus comes, we will live forevermore in our long lost home. God bless you. <music>